I'm, I'm curious, how many of you have worked in a, a business enterprise yet in, in your life? Have worked in some sort of shop or, yeah, been on the producer side of things. Um, to me, my beginning of my own personal economic understanding began when I, when I got my first job, which is more difficult now uh, than it was when I was young. Um, we had a little tactic when you were um, 14 or so in those days for getting a job, for subverting the, the child labor laws, you would simply uh, lie about your age. I mean, it was very, now it's not as easy to do that anymore, but back in those days, uh, they, the boss would ask you, well, how old are you, son? And you'd say, 16. You know, <laughs> however old do you happen to be? So I don't know, I think I was like 12 or so. I don't know what it was, but... Um, so I, my, one of my first jobs was, was uh, working for uh, a, a department store. And... Uh, so uh, uh, he wanted me, the, the boss wanted me to work in returns. This is where people bring, up, bring back their products, you know, and you sort of deal with them. And uh, so the first return I got, was the first day on the job, and a guy walks in <laughs> with, uh, I still remember, there was a time when everybody wore these little sort of silky running suits. I don't know, like guys would wear them. They would sort of be silky, and I don't know, why. everybody wanted them. Um, I guess that's not true anymore, but in those days. So we, we used to sell, sell these silky running suits. I mean, very strange. They had stripes down the side, vi vibrant blue or something. And he walked in. He said, look, I just have to return this thing because it fell apart. So I looked at this running suit, and it, it was clear that he had ran like 200 miles in this thing. You know? I mean, it, it was just disheveled and falling apart. It had like the polyester was, had sort of like those little peels on it, you know, when the legs would rub together or something like that. Horrible. I didn't want to touch the thing. I thought, why don't you get it clean before you brought it in? This is terrible. Uh, and he said, well, look, it's got this little tear over here on the side. And you know, I said, you know, I'm sorry, this just looks like a used piece of clothing. I mean, how can you possibly bring this back to us? And he said, well, you sold it to me. You have to stand behind your product. So I was a little confused. You know, so I went to the boss. And he said, well, of course, we have to take it back. And you know, I remember just being appalled by this. You know, what? And I said to, I said to my boss, I said, what are, what are we, slaves to these people or something? This is nuts. He said, yes, in fact, we are. We're, <laughs> we're slaves to these people. They're called our customers. And um, I never quite got over that, you know, um, uh, working from the producer anger, angle. Uh, you do get sympathetic with, with the point of view of, of business enterprise. I think some of, many of us walk around as consumers all the time. We only think about um, our rights, and we tend to um, just, you know, and, and our choices in life, and we don't think about it from the point of view of the producer or, or the business. And part of thinking uh, about economics involves thinking about uh, the way the world works from the point of view of the producer, and I hope to talk about a, a little of that today. My second job, by the way, was working in that same shop. He took me out of returns and put me in, uh, in the business of cleaning the bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that really made me sympathetic with the, uh, with the departments, from the department store point of view. And I developed a radical anti-consumer attitude, which I think actually all businesses would if they weren't utterly and completely dependent on the consumers for their very lifeblood. You know, that's, so um, uh, my third job was working in a catering service. So I got to see how uh, consumers aren't always well treated. You know, but anyway. So often, my subject today concerns technology. The picture I put up here on the board, I don't know if you can see it very well. It's kind of regrettable. Uh, what you see are, are uh, several ships, and everybody on the ship is killing each other. They're killing the other people on the other ship, and the people on the other ship, again, they're blowing each other up. Um, that is not an example of productivity. Um, <laughs> that is... Wealth destruction, okay? So if you can remember that, when you see people on boats and they're all killing each other and blowing each other up, that's wealth destruction, okay? That's not, that's not a good thing for a civilization when that sort of thing happens. Um, this book I have here is on, on uh, life in the Middle Ages, and basically there are two kinds of pictures. And one set of pictures, people are killing each other, and the other set of pictures, uh, people are producing things, you know? So I, I, I thought it was interesting because there's two great forces in the history of civilization, you know? On the one hand, uh, the coercion, on the other hand, voluntary cooperation and production. I mean, that's the essential divide in life, you know, between uh, uh, the activity we might call politics on one hand and the other we might call just markets on the other. Yeah, so that's, that's the great dividing line in, in world history. Uh, Rothbard called it power and market. We could call it politics or technology, whatever you want to call it. Let me switch this to a much more beautiful picture. Um, 
Ah, uh, here's, here's a much nicer picture here. You see that? These people sort of hammering stones and carrying them around. That's probably about the 13th century. Um, a fantastic number of pictures in this charming little book are about technology. And to a large extent, we define ourselves as people according to the tools we use and the technology we use. Um, I remember, I'll never forget the first time one of my children asked me, Dad, were you born before the, before the internet? Yeah? Okay, so, yeah, yeah, I remember when the internet first came along, you know, and I reminisce about these old days, and they're just sitting there with their eyes wide open in amazement, you know. Well, how did you, how did you, how did you find out stuff? Uh, I hardly remember myself. I mean, it, uh, uh, so we, we, we did things like we would, um, we would take out these, this paper stuff and you'd write things on it, you know, and uh, then you'd fold it and put it in an envelope with a special sticker and give it to a government employee, you know, who would get in a car and drive it around until <laughs> he could drop it in somebody else's box and so on. And that's the way the world worked up until the day before yesterday, you know, that was, that was it. So you wonder how uh, things have gotten so much more productive since the, since the uh, advent of the internet. That's how. We define ourselves as the digital age. It's a very exciting time to be alive. Um, I would encourage you to look back in history. Remember that this digital age hasn't always been with us. A wonderful novel I would encourage you all to read is by uh, Garrett Garrett. It's called The Cinder Buggy. Actually, we have it downstairs. And what he does is chronicle the, uh, the switch between the age of uh, iron and the advent of steel in the 19th century uh, in America and all of the attendant social upheavals that are associated with that change in technology, the vast productivity that came about, the enormous risk that entrepreneurs and businesses took to bring about this social transformation. Um, it all involved, of course, business enterprise and the profit and loss system, and it led to dramatic cultural and social upheaval that benefited civilization. And you can look back at history and see that this happens again and again Throughout history, uh, mankind has always been struggling to improve his lot in life. Um, in this little picture we see here, um, we see people carrying around stones and using various tools uh, to do it. Um, and this one, I thought this was very interesting. We have a, a fancy little 16th century machine here for crushing rocks, you know. Um, uh, one of the most famous inventions in human history uh, you probably all know, is the, uh, the printing press uh, with the first uh, Gutenberg Psalter uh, that in uh, 1450, which, which, which led to uh, a total upheaval um, in dramatic ways, especially in the culture of the monasteries. Uh, this gentleman you see right here is a, is a scribe, and uh, there are a number of pictures of scribes here. There's another one here and a scribe over here, uh, right here. Uh, before, before the age of the printing press, most of the works of the scribes were devoted entirely to preserving works. That was the, that was the main thing. Um, uh, today we have print-on-demand printing, so everybody can be an author. Um, but back in those days, to be a new author, you had to uh, have a lot of social standing or be particularly brilliant because it would take a whole team of scribes many years to complete your original manuscript. I mean, you had to be St. Thomas Aquinas or uh, Cardinal so-and-so or Bishop so-and-so. Then you could get your book published. But uh, typical workers and peasants did not get new books published. Uh, most of the works of the scribe was, was devoted to preserving great manuscripts, for example, um, the, um, the great book by uh, uh, St. Uh, Isidore of Seville of the 8th eighth, eighth century, which, which sought to compile all human knowledge in one great treatise called uh, Etymologiae, um, continued to be reprinted by scribes over the centuries. And in fact, it was one of the first books that was printed in the age of movable type. And you could imagine what kind of, what kind of effects printing had, from the producer point of view, uh, the scribes worried very much that they would be out of business. And in fact, uh, they were. They were an exalted class, especially within the monasteries. This, the, to be a scribe was, was a much coveted position. Um, and some, some, some 
heads of monasteries actually resisted the printing press because they feared that it was going to lead to widespread unemployment of their smartest people. And um, it took about 50 to 100 years for uh, monasteries of Europe to reconcile themselves to the printing press, realizing that it was actually a good thing if they could print their own things, that it would uh, be able to, this, this gentleman who's obviously very wise and very smart, would be able to devote his talents instead of uh, copying the works of others to writing his own books and having those propagated out. So the innovation actually led to a more economical use of his own time and talents. And so it was up and down the entire monastery. Um, but we can always expect some kind of uh, some kind of transition difficulties anytime there are new technologies. You know, if you look back at, at the history um, in the first millennium, uh, the first, I think Tom Woods points this out in his, in his wonderful, wonderful book on, uh, um, I think it's called, it was it the How Catholic Church Saves Civilization or something like that, yeah. But he talks about uh, technology in the first millennium and points to the fact that, that the largest, the first large scale capitalist enterprises in Europe, actually dated from the 8th and the 9th centuries, they occurred in monasteries. And here's the way it would work. It's very interesting. Um, um, the new monastery would be founded with some ideal that everybody would, would share in the workload. So some would go out and uh, tend to the livestock, others would do woodworking, work out in the fields, and, and so on. And everybody would share equally in these tasks. But um, as the years would go on, uh, they also discovered that there were uh, peasants and other workers that were not monks out you know, in the community who needed jobs, so they would hire them, and they began to develop large-scale um, industrial hiring techniques within vineyards. Suddenly you needed accountants, you needed, um, uh, so some monks needed to turn their attention away from tending livestock to running the, the books in the monastery, so they would come from the outdoors to the indoors, and the tools would improve and become ever more efficient, and people would have to specialize in using the tools and making the tools. Well, over, over several hundred years, uh, the monastery would, would completely change. Instead of, instead of a, a place of perfect equality where all monks would work hard out in the fields and then pray when they weren't working, um, you developed a kind of a, a class system where the, the, the monks would all stay indoors uh, doing sort of indoor intellectual work while the workers and peasants were all outside you know, doing the, the hard manual labor, some one monk would come along and say, look, look at this system we've created. This is crazy. I and mean, this is just contrary to our founding ideals. And would break off and start a new order of monks. And every new order of monks that was, that was founded was ever more dedicated to uh, uh, stricter and stricter rules concerning what people had to do in terms of their work. You know, so the new monastery would be founded. And in my monastery, nobody's going to be even allowed to wear shoes. You know, or you're not going to own any property at all. You're only going to be allowed to have like a bed and a crucifix and that's it. You know, ever more strict. And part of this was having to do with having to crack down on the prosperity that would come about from the development of these large scale capitalist enterprises. That always leads to some kind of upheaval. Um, and every age can be defined according to the technology that comes about. And I'm sure you all in this room will define yourselves. I mean, there will be a come a time when you have, you have children and you'll be talking about what it was like when you were kids. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like in the future. And you'll talk about what it was like to use the World Wide Web or when you, when you first uh, held your first iPod and these kinds of things. And they'll reminisce with you and say, well, that's amazing. What was that like? You know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it has been. I, there's a picture hanging in my own house, and I, I love this picture. It's, it tells you so much. It was taken about in 1923, and it has my you know, great, great, I don't know, ancestors there, but cousins. So on the front row, you've got um, these old guys in beards with war medals on from the Civil War. And they're sitting there very crabby and annoyed about something, probably the photographer. And then next to them are their wives, and, you know, and, and then you've got the second generation behind them. And then behind them on the back row, there's a long row of young men. They look like they're about, about, about 17, 18 or something. And they've, they're, they're, they're all looking there sort of disdainful, like, why am I having to be in this stupid family photo? <laughs> um, and they've all got these funny little hats on. You know, they're sort of like flat hats, and they're kind of like over their eyes or like a setting on the side. And if you look at them, you realize, oh, I've seen this hat in old movies. This is the hat that people used to wear when they drove a car. It was like the official driving hat, you know. 
And uh, so that was the, like the old people, like the guy in the front row with the medals on, Civil War medals, there's no way he's getting in a car, right? But the guys in the back row are driving a car now for the first time. They're the first driving generation, you know, and they define themselves that way, you know. We drive. They don't, you know. <laughs> They're really cocky, you know, they have this kind of, you know. So that's the way it is. So every, every new generation has this uh, attachments to the technology they used. It was true in the, in the Middle Ages, and it's true in, in our own time. The term technology itself, you know, it didn't come into popular usage, you won't believe this, until after World War II. It's not the common term. Um, it's the term we use now. Um, I, I found a little bit about the etymology of the term itself. It comes from the Indo-European root of the, um, called, it, the word is text, T E. T-E-K-S, and it means to fabricate or to weave. Very nice imagery there. Um, the, the, the Greek word tektron referred to a, a carpenter or a builder. Before um, uh, the 20th century, back in the 19th century, 18th century, the word technology was usually replaced with, a, which I think is a much nicer term, called the practical arts. The practical arts. That's what, what technology used to be called back then. And, and it referred to the fact that, that, um, that technology is really uh, about um, a creative process of generating something that's, that's truly artistic. Um, it, it requires human, human ingenuity and, and skill and testing, really, uh, with the consumer base to tr try new things out to achieve certain practical ends in life the practical arts. And a focus on the practical arts helps us understand that so much of the world we live in and have always lived in, um, as far back as we look, is human built. You know, uh, nature give us, gives us raw resources, but nature is itself extremely dangerous place and unpleasant. Um, everything else that we experience and everything we strive to live for is made with, with human hands. Um, uh, this is, and I'm, we're going to hear a little bit more about this later, this is, to me, the absurdity of, of the environmentalist vision to herald uh, uh, the natural environment uh, beyond that which people made. Nobody would, in this room would be alive if we had the pure environmentalist uh, dream achieved. The world that we experience and that we want to experience and that we've always experienced is largely made by human hands. Um, and so the great question from an economic point of view is whether or not what are the means that lead to uh, the ever greater perfection of this human-built world? And uh, traditionally, there are two ways to understand the, the means by which this comes about. One is the, the theory of uh, collective innovation, and the other is the theory of individual innovation. I would like to talk about both those points of view. In the collective view, the idea is that, that uh, the government or society at large has to be responsible for making great innovations. Uh, this view is still with us whenever you hear presidents, whether it's Obama or Bush or anybody else, talking about the need to invest as a society in something, uh, invest in large-scale infrastructure. Um, you know, in World War II, the uh, government that fought the war built the bomb, you know, so there's a great explosion in technological advance, and it, and it comes about coll collectively, that we need to invest in arts and sciences or whatever the case may be. The problem with that method of collective innovation is that there's really no market test to find out uh, whether or not that's a good use of social resources or not. In the market economy, there's constantly a test. In, in, the, in the collective economy of government-built things, there is no test to find out if the resources are being used efficiently or not. Um, one example that people point to as, as, a, as a great case of collective entrepreneurship would be uh, the invention of the internet, which everybody knows was, was built by the government. Well, it was built back by, by the government, but uh, the government never did anything with it. Um, it was private enterprise that turned it into a productive, useful thing for us. Uh, uh, government technology can, be, uh, can come too soon, it can come too late, qu quite often. Government uh, constantly funds old technologies, or it funds them too soon before society is ready for them. And, Let's be, let's be clear about technology. It has to come around at the right time. Let's say you lived in the age of the scribe, and a monk walked in and said to the scribe, um, listen, I've got a great new innovation. It's called one-click ordering. 
<laughs> well, what would anybody be able to do with a one-click method of ordering things on the internet in the age of the scribe, right? It doesn't make any sense, right? So it's, it's not just about the ideas uh, or, the, or, the, or the notion, it's about its usability and its economic uh, viability. Now, the other theory of, of innovation is that it's entirely individual and it's about great individuals. Um, I think we have to be careful about this interpretation as well. This theory of entrepreneurship or the theory of, of innovation and development that it all comes down to the great in individuals and their great ideas really developed in the Gilded Age in the late 19th century when there was a, a new class of capitalists that came along that wanted to replace the, the traditional view that the great figures in human history were politicians and war makers and wanted to replace it with a view that the industrial captains of industry were really the people we need to be celebrating. I have no problem with that, but it led to certain exaggerations. Um, and let me just give you a, a couple of cases in point. Um, uh, I think we're all taught in school that Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. I think I was, I was taught that. Um, and I had a vision of everybody taking these lumps of cotton off the off, I grew up in Texas, so you take the lump of cotton off the plant there and sort of have to pick out the seed all the time, and that's the way people dealt with cotton until the great Eli Whitney genius came along who invented a machine where you could just sort of stuff the cotton in the machine and spat out the seeds on one end, and then out came the cloth or whatever. I don't know what, what the, <laughs> the idea was. Well, you know, if you look at the details of this history, it turns out this is a, a, an, an amazing myth. Um, uh, it turns out cotton ginning has been around since about the 5th century and with great improvements and innovations made from the 12th to the 14th century, and long before Eli Whitney, all throughout the American South, uh, cotton was always ginned, usually with roller pens or some other machine. Um, and there have been continual innovations throughout history. It wasn't just that Eli Whitney came along with one brilliant idea and changed history. No, it's not at all true. What happened is that Eli Whitney took an existing machine, and thanks to a suggestion made, made to him by a friend of his, who was a woman, by the way, he added a small uh, uh, brush technique to the machine. Uh, wh why we know about Eli Whitney is versus uh, everybody else involved in the long... 2,000-year uh, process of coming up with a modern cotton gin is that he got to the patent office first before anybody else did, and then turned around and used his patent to beat up all the competition, and went around the South suing everybody. He was ginning cotton, claiming that they owed him money. Okay, so this is the truth about our friend Eli Whitney. <laughs> a, a similar story can be told about Alexander Graham Bell who did not invent the telephone, and those rotten Wright brothers, I'm just fed up with hearing about the Wright brothers. Uh, the, the evil Wright brothers, you know, they were, they were running a little scam outfit that was really just a, um, uh, a uh, I mean, they paid more lawyers than they did anybody else, and, and their, their goal was to, of course, to get the first patent, you know, on the first in flight. There were about 20 competitors for the title first in flight. They made one little improvement in the wing, raced to the patent office, and then demanded that the U.S. Buy, government buy their airplane and spent the next uh, 15 years suing everybody who was, was uh, really trying to make real improvements in the airplane and succeeding. So by the time World War I rolled around, the U.S. was so backward in its air technology that we had to buy our planes from France you know, that didn't actually have any patents on airplanes, on uh, flying technology. So fortunately, at, during World War I, U.S. government suspended patent enforcement on the airplane and then advances could be made. So anyway, my point is that, that the history of innovation is not really the history of great men or great women doing amazing things out of nowhere. You know, one minute everybody's talking on like cups of strings and then Alexander Graham Bell and this, you know, the, the iPod or whatever, I don't know, but... I mean, it doesn't happen like that. What happens is a series of small steps. And this is the way it, 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 it happens in our world today. You know, every day you go online, you find some, some, some small improvement. Somebody takes an existing technology, improves it just slightly a little bit, and markets it. Um, in order to understand how that works, though, you need to understand something about the way the, um, the, the process of market competition works. And it works like this. Um, an entrepreneur sees a need. For example, in Auburn, for many years, we didn't have any donut shops. So one guy opens up a donut shop right over here in college, and he's, and he's making uh, enormous profits with this donut shop. I mean, you can tell it. You go in there, and you know, I talk to him all the time. You know, How much do you make by selling that 50-cent donut? Well, you know, I don't know. It cost me about 10 cents to make. Okay, he's making 40 cents a donut. But he's still got to pay people, got to pay taxes. Nonetheless, the profits are there. This serves as a signal to other possible 
entrepreneurs in town that, uh, th that this is a profitable enterprise. That, that signal, that profit signal, is uh, like broadcasting out to every entrepreneur, every, every, every uh, owner of capital in Auburn, look, this is a, a possible way that you can make money by selling donuts. So the guy, uh, so a possible entrepreneur goes into the donut shop and examines how they do things. And he's over there taking mental pictures you know, of everything he sees. And so he copies, he copies the behavior of the donut shop down there. It's a process of emulation. And I hope you write down that word, emulation, because this is the essence of entrepreneurship. This is how it begins. It begins with copying what other people are doing. But it's not just an, enough just to copy precisely what the person is doing. What you have to do is improve it just slightly, because you have to, you have to get the customers to come to you as opposed to him. All right? Or you can, you can, uh, your innovation may consist of better marketing promoting of the donuts in a better way than the other guy did, so you get ever more customers. Or it could, or it could consist of saving uh, in the costs associated with donut making. Whatever it is, you've got to make an improvement on the existing uh, uh, profitable enterprise down here. Okay, so you open up your business, you've made the improvement, you've reduced costs, you've made the donuts even better tasting, uh, you've got a better process for making them, you've, 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 you're, you're, you've, taken, you've rented a spot that has um, uh, lower rents, possibly. Okay, so then what happens? You get customers, and that guy's losing customers, his profitability goes down, or he has to compete with you. Uh, adopt new technologies, new designs, cut costs, whatever the case might be. It's going to reduce his profit margins. So on one hand, the guy over here is this profitable, you've opened up your shot, you're becoming this profitable, but look, his profits begin to go down, right? All through this process of emulation first and competition second. Then a third donut shop opens up. Everybody's profits are pushed further and further down. This is the way the process works. Um, in the competitive market process, everybody copies everybody else and improves just slightly on the margin. Uh, just a little bit, enough to solicit more traffic, uh, customer contact with himself, and profits are eventually driven down to what level? In an ideal world, if you, if you construct this thing out, profits are driven down to zero. And I always like to tell people this as a way of, of addressing uh, some, of the, some of the socialists who, who are under the impression that capitalism is a big conspiracy to protect the rights of, of profit makers. It strikes me that capitalism is nothing but a gigantic conspiracy to reduce all profits in the world to zero. You know, it's, 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 it's a disaster for producers. You have to constantly stay alert and constantly innovate or else you die. That's the way the, that's the, way the truth of the market works. Um, now, some of you are probably going to be looking into business in the future, and I would urge you as, as you look into this not to try to be a Wright Brothers, one of the Wright Brothers or an Eli Whitney or an Alexander Graham Bell or these other guys, but rather to look for successful behaviors in the market. Emulate them, copy them, and improve them just slightly. That's how people make money in a market economy, through slight improvements on the margin. It's true in our day, and it was true in the, in the 12th century. It was true all the way back to the beginning of time. Um, so I reject this, this model that entrepreneurship is collective or that innovation occurs collectively, and neither does it occur through just great men. It occurs through people just like yourselves who are out there just trying to improve the world a little bit at a time. But look what this depends on most fundamentally. It depends on the freedom to save and build capital. It depends on the freedom to try and fail, since not every experiment in the business world is successful. Uh, far more businesses fail than, than succeed. And you need the freedom to constantly improve without uh, interventions like uh, uh, high regulations or, or patents or other, other restrictions on what people can and cannot do. You need a free flow of information precisely so that people can learn from each other and emulate the success of other people. That's the way we, we are going to progress as a society. You, you notice that government does, does none of these things. It's only markets that do this. So my final advice to you in this short talk is that as you pursue uh, your lives, I hope that you all at some point go to work for a small producer of some sort so you can get a, a picture of what it's like to be on the other side of the aisle. It can drive you crazy. I know my children hate to go shopping with me because um, I'll walk into something like Dick's Sporting Goods over here in Tigertown and I open the door and I'm overwhelmed at the sheer volume of inventory the inventory, and I'll, I'll start calculating costs. You know, I'll look up that ship on the wall, and the, the, the uh, fishing poles over there, and the footballs over there, and the huge machines over there, and I think, God, 
and it says 20 million, there's probably 30 million, there's probably 50 million dollars worth of inventory in this place. You realize, kids, if this place had to buy all that stuff, <laughs> and here we are, who do we think we are? We can walk in, just kind of cruise around, look at these machines, and go, well, I like that, I kind of like that, I'm not going to buy anything, and walk right out of here again. And there's nothing these people can do about it. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, it's a terrifying thing for me to walk into a store with a large amount of inventory. But it's good for you to be able to think about uh, the way the economy works from the point of view of the producer. If you want to be one of these producers, get good at copying, get good at emulating, get good at improving and perfecting, and never rest until the day you die. And then you will leave something spectacular for the next generation. Thank you very much.